Expedition 44 here with Matt and Ryan again. We have started a new series on original sin, nature of man, kind of talking about total depravity, all of that stuff. Last time we really jumped into more of a history lesson on original sin. That was we got some some several comments, emails, things like that saying they had no idea any of that existed. So that was kind of fun for us to kind of go yeah. into that. Where are we going today, Matt? What are we talking about? Yeah, so like you said last episode, we talked about history, and we believe that there was an original sin, but uh, that affected our relationship with God. Something, Something's different as a result of, of what happened in the Garden of Eden. We're going to look at the Garden of Eden today. Um, but last episode, we really looked at where Augustine and the Reformers and how they introduced this kind of unorthodox view of original sin where guilt transfers from Adam to all humanity and in total depravity if you attach that to it means that we're totally unable to seek after God that we're disabled in our will our mind our all of that stuff so today we're actually since we did a whole bunch of history in the last episode today we're going to do a whole bunch of scripture yeah before we start that I think it's important that we just kind of again take a time out and we just kind of preface where we're going today and so when we look at original sin, there's some kind of hermeneutical laws or rules that we always live by, whether you call them textures of interpretation or law, whatever that might be, that Matt and I feel like we're always going to interpret the Bible with, with the same lens, with the same approach. And one of those things is that we don't want to dissect or disconnect the Old Testament from the New. If it was true, and I sort of mentioned this in the last video, if it was true in the Old Testament, it's likely going to be true and very similar in the New Testament. Yep. Now there's foreshadows, there's connections. It might operate somewhat differently or be painting the picture for, for the approach of the way something was going to differ in the New Testament, but they have to be very connected. And yep. so when you talk about original sin in any traditional or messianic Judaic circles, it's a very different conversation than in evangelical Delical, circles yep. because the Old Testament is likely held in a higher perspective or view than maybe even the New Testament. And so... And that's because of the Torah and the devotion that goes into it and everything else. And so so I, I kind of want to say that today we're going to take an Old Testament look, and we'll get to the New Testament, mm -hmm. at what the original sin did. And the way this flushes out is it is the word itself is really the desire or the propensity to want to do those things. So at the at the tree, we were given this option, good and evil, that's tovra, like which way do you want to go? And so in Judaic circles, you're going to have simply interpreted desire. Mm -hmm. Is this good desire or is it bad desire? Is it desire that naturally is going to funnel you towards the path towards God or is it desire that's going to take you mm -hmm. away? And neither one of them is inherently bad, so to speak. You would you would think of of, of the we, we talk about the tree of good and evil, and we're going to get yeah. more into this. But it wasn't all evil. There, yeah. there was something going on there. And it was it's, the knowledge of. It was the knowledge, knowledge of, yeah. not necessarily this is good or evil. It's just knowing between good and evil. So this is a hard one because this is kind of you know called the Yetzirah of, of the desire that pulls you that way. I like to think of it as like the Star Wars force. Um, and this is the way I had a whole ch chapter that kind of connects some Star Wars things. And that's very similar. The force can be a good thing or a bad thing. And so in this idea, it's, it's as, as you're pulled towards a worldly or even evil desire, the way that you react to that is either going to make God smile or frown. Mm -hmm. That's the best way to consider it. So even though it's in your propensity to, to maybe be lured in by the world, if you react to that positively, it brings honor back to God. Now, I'm being very careful here because I have so many friends that are Messianic and traditional Jews, and this is a hot topic. And so if you're an evangelical Christian, 
you can't understand this in the Judaic roots. Like this is, this is something that has more theories. So Matt and I are into theories of atonement and however you hash that out, eight, 10, 12 theories of atonement. If you go to your average church and you, you know, take the eight pastors on staff and you say, hey, tell me about the atonement theories, they're kind of going to look at you blankly and be like, eh, yeah, we're not really sure. There may be one or two. <laughs> yeah. And so, so they're just not really familiar with that. But yet, when you go to any, any kind of circle of Hebraic thought, you're going to get, this is, this is something that everybody could talk over and over and over. In fact, in the last month, I listened to a three-part lecture on the Yetzer, um, I believe it was Yale or Harvard that this three-part lecture was given. And and it was, I mean, really, really in-depth. It was basically going over all the different theories of this. And we're not, this is not an exhaustive one, although I've been tempted to do an exhaustive version on this. But I think this might be as close as we're going to get on Expedition 44. So if you are of my Hebraic friendship group, you might think differently about this, but I, I'm just going to say if that's the case, you've probably thought about it a whole lot more than anybody else listening to yep. this. And we respect yep. differences view. In fact, one of the things I love so much about the Hebraic culture is that different thoughts are welcomed and celebrated. Mm -hmm. And so you often get people Unity and diversity. Yeah, coming together Friday night to Saturday and staying up all night, you know, basically bantering about different thoughts. And it's welcome. You would like research this and you would stay up and you'd have it yet. I hate to say it, but it seems like in our evangelical world, those turn into fights. Mm -hmm. Those aren't welcomed. Yeah, those aren't turn celebrated. Into people out. To, yeah. To yeah. And so, uh, so that's kind of where, where my background comes from. Is I, I like to have these conversations. I think it strengthens our connection to the Scripture, to God. It makes us rethink our own mm -hmm. thoughts and work through all the different it makes things. Us appreciate the diversity within each other. While, while centering on the core things. Yeah. So, so there's going to be some people that listen to this that say we're barely touching the tip of the iceberg, and we know that. Mm -hmm. Like, we're, like we, we could do a 50-part series on the answer. <laughs> <laughs> but we just want to introduce it with the idea of original sin. So to do that, Matt, let's start with Genesis 2 and 3. Yep, so the first part of our episode today we're going to look at and kind of go through... Uh, overview of Genesis 2 and 3 and how does that tie into original sin. First we need to look at, uh, in Genesis we see Adam and Eve as the first priests in the garden. We've gone over yep. this many times in our videos. Yep. In Eden, which is kind of the holy of holies, they have a vocation to image God, to, to bear his likeness. Yep. Um, and so God gives them one command, not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, Genesis 2, 15 to 17 says this, And the Lord took man and put him in the garden and to cultivate it and keep it. The Lord commanded the man, saying, For any of the trees in the garden you may freely eat, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you will surely die. All right, so where we're going with here is first knowledge of good and evil. It's, as we said earlier, it's, it's the not. knowledge of good and evil. It's not just the tree of good and evil. And usually, even in evangelical circles, we focus on the evil. It's yeah. not just the tree of evil. We, we, she, she ate from the tree of evil and she became evil. When that's actually not, <laughs> not what it what says. The text says. <laughs> yeah. no, she had the knowledge of good and evil. Yeah. Their eyes were opened. And then we have the, the good and evil. And the words on that, and this is really what's going to drive this whole message today, is good is Tov. And so we've spent a lot of time on this. Uh, yeah, word. we had Scott McKnight on. He's talked about a church called Tov. We had him on for Pivot, which is creating cultures of Tov, of goodness in the church. And then a lot of people know that the Hebrew word for evil is Ra. And that comes into a lot of different things. So you might think of... Um, at the end of a lot of Egyptian gods' names, you'll see a hyphen Ra. Ra. Yep. Yeah. And Ham and Ra. Why, why is that? Isn't that, I mean, people have never thought of this, but why is it that the god was associated with, with evil. evil? Yeah. And so those were names that were given to this supposed god. And, you know, they always wondered how the gods thought of them or if they were in favor of the mm -hmm. gods. And I always joke that... Well, you named this God the evil God. Yeah. Like, what uh -huh. What do you think he's going to do to you? Or did so the Hebrew language adopt that and make it evil? Yeah. <laughs> so, right. so, yeah. 
Now, what's really interesting is surely die in Hebrew is usually not translated. In fact, Net Bible sort of handles this okay. Several Hebrew Bibles are going to handle this much different than what your English translations are because in Hebrew it's really best read die, die. Muth, muth. Yeah, muth, muth is the way that it reads. Um, when you open up your, sometimes I, I say things like this and I get people open up interlinears and they're going to say, well, it doesn't say muth, muth. It actually does. You're, mm -hmm. you're, you're going to read it so that there's obviously some some changing in the words a little bit like we say walking instead of walk but that's what you're reading in your inner linear and so it's pretty much die die muth muth and the and the place that most theologians have fallen on this is there's a double death happening and so when the when the fruit is going to be partaken they're going to be separated from the presence of God. So that's the first step. Now this is, you gotta be careful here because what it looks like in Hebrew is it's an ongoing death. Both of these are an ongoing yeah. death. It's not an immediate yeah. death, it's that you're you're going to be now walking the road of mm -hmm. separation. Yep. And so- And you're dying, you will die. Yeah, <laughs> and so, so both of them are this kind of ongoing death. It's a double ongoing death. And so the first one is that they're no longer walking directly in the presence of God. They're going to be away from the presence of God. However, as we know in the Old Testament, the presence of God still comes and goes. That's mm -hmm. that, you know, with the Israelites, that's that Shekinah, cloud. Yeah. yeah, the Shekinah glory. And so today in our, now that we have Jesus in our life and we are a temple of the Holy Spirit, like some of us at some times are more in the spirit than at other times are. And so that's the sort of coming and going. But I'm going to say that we'll never completely return to the life that they had walking hand in hand with God until we likely get to a recreated heaven and earth. Yep. And so that's where life is returned. Now the second death, die, die, the second one is that because we no longer have the tree, and again, there's a, there's a lot of theories on this, but most, most good theories are going to say that death was going to be there from the beginning, yet the the tree or the garden yep. that they were interacting like with was sustaining life. Yeah, and so that's why like Adam and is created from from the dirt. Yep, he's the dirt man. Um, and so dirt equaled mortality. And it yep. says like in Second Timothy that only God is immortal. Yeah, and so there's this view that we are born with immortality. We aren't born with immortality. We're right. born mortal, and God sustains us. Just like God sustains everything, in him we live, yep. move, and have our being. It's only yep. in him that that is sustained. So the two deaths are going to start and be continual. One of them is going to be a physical dying, and the second one is going to be a separation, separation. from God. Now, both of them eventually are going to be reclaimed or mm -hmm. regained, because even though we don't have a physical life like we do now, most people are going to believe that we're going to be given a new life and the new heavens and the new earth and that's going to sort of take a physical slash spirit, spiritual embodiment and then also begin to be reinstated to that life of walking directly in the presence of God. So there's those two things. Now, again, this gets to be a very Hebraic controversial conversation and so if you only had the Old Testament, would you ever arrive that there's going to be eternal life. I don't know if you would get that. There's a couple clues. <laughs> so, so, but we so don't have time to get into that today. There we're, we go. we're talking about original sin, so let's keep going on that. We're going to look at, now let's turn over Genesis 3. If you have your Bibles, do that. We're going to first read verses 1 through 7, uh, which say that, And now the serpent was more crafty than any of the beasts of the field, which the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, this is the snake talking, Indeed, has God said, you shall not eat from any tree in the garden. The woman said to the serpent, from the trees of the garden you may eat, but from the, the tree in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat or touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, surely you will not die, for the Lord knows that on the day you eat it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, be like Elohim. Yep. It, it is there, I believe. Um, so knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, 
and that it was delightful to the eyes and the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate and she gave it to her husband with her and he ate and the eye, their eyes were both opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. There is so much here. Yes. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to move through this quicker. This is one of those areas that I... I pra my degree is practically in Genesis 2 and 3. And yeah. so I could like sit here for years and talk about this. But I'm going to try to make it quick. And so most people believe the serpent is lying to Eve. Now mm -hmm. I'm going to say, read it again. Yeah. I'm not sure the serpent is lying to Eve. So we're same we're, word for shrewd, isn't it? The right. same word we use for wisdom in the Where proverb. Where you see this is you will surely die. Well, was that a lie or was that true? You know, that's that's con controversial. And so you have this spiritual being, the Nahash, the snake coming in there. The other thing you have to think of, and, and this is going to, I'm sure you've heard this, but we've got videos on this. Um, there's two stories. Genesis 2 tells the story of Adam being put in there. There's no question in my mind Adam was the first man. I think the Bible is very clear about that. And then 3. And there's a lot of controversy. Is, is this the same story? Is one it recursive? One, yeah, 1 versus 2. One, yeah. You know, that, that kind of thing. And so you can view it either way in this conversation, as I guess is where I'm going. And so Yeah, if, we got a video on that. <laughs> we got a video on that. If, if you... If you view it as Adam was the, the first person, I think you're going to find either way. The only question is, what about Eve? But this gets into this conversation because when you say surely die, if you're, I'm not pre-Adamite, even though some people might think I am. I believe that when Adam was created, there were other people created on the garden with them. And that's why when God, God, when God goes to make a mate for him, he says there are no, no others suitable. So I believe you have Adam you know here placed in the garden there's kind of a lower earth there's people going on i don't you probably don't believe this way i'm just explaining what i think and then eve is going to be created from adam and so in two she might not have been hearing this if you believe that she wasn't there so she's hearing it again in three and so she gets kind of her own set of instructives which are going to be very similar to what Adam might have gotten into but here's the difference Adam might have understood death mm -hmm. and Eve wouldn't have mm -hmm. and so of course they might be having these conversations but we don't know how that worked we don't know how the language worked in the garden or at the beginning of time or things like that a lot of people think it was more caveman ooh, 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 that kind of thing not yeah, necessarily language we don't know. So we don't know how much of that conversation was necessarily had. There's even theories that believe that the only language or understanding was sort of transcendental between God and the woman and God and the man, but the man and the woman didn't really have the communication patterns at that time. So there's a lot we don't know going on here, but I also just, in saying all this, I want to bring out the point that when she's talking to the Nahash, she might not understand what death means at this point. The, the muth muth or something like that. But what we do know is that that's going to change the course of history and that that's going to set the path for the first fall or for the original sin. Now, I say first fall, that's even controversial. You could argue there was a fall or maybe even two or three before that. But yep. we're going to call that the Spiritual original beings. sin. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So um, when we see the Nahash, uh, the this, this serpent tempt Eve, um, he may be trying to get, possibly trying to get Eve to doubt God. And um, basically, he's, but he, what he does say is when you eat of this, you will be like the spiritual beings. Yeah. So we've talked about that Eden was a garden... Uh, temple on top of a mountain. We get pictures of this in the Bible. Um, that was full the, of spiritual beings. Full of spiritual beings. Yeah. It was basically God's throne room. Right, is what it was. It was the holy of holies. And so He's like, "Hey, you're gonna be like the divine council." And <laughs> I, I love the Bible projects take on. Yeah, they have several videos yeah, that spiritual go over this series. And whenever they show Eden, they show all these uh, crazy looking spiritual it's on beings on top of a mountain. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty it's cool. So Eve may have misquoted the commandment, but Basically, some think that maybe Adam didn't teach her the commandment right. That's right. another view that yeah. that's out there also. Um, 
But it could be that she was doing like what the Pharisees often did, was which was called building a fence around Torah. Yes. You know, Jesus even does this. He says, you've heard it said, don't kill, but right. don't even get angry, right? Yeah. So by not getting angry, you're not going to kill. He, he said, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery, but don't lust. So he's saying, if you don't lust, you're not going to commit adultery. And what, maybe what Eve is saying is like, hey, if I don't touch the tree, I won't eat from the tree. Yeah. And so that could be another view that we're doing. I love how you said about building the fence around the Torah. Fences are big Hebraically. Yeah. And so that kind of ties into this Yetzer conversation where we're going at mm-hmm. the same point because essentially what you believed is that the Hebrew language itself looks like in many ways fences and you would put fences to keep the outside out for protection mm-hmm. for instruction for all of those things and it was associated with a better view of learning and understanding and it was also associated with making a place for God to land mm-hmm. in your fence yep um, and so keep going here maybe Eve is saying that like hey if I don't touch it I'm not going to eat it yep. Most of our temptations usually come from within us, I think, of yeah, seeing things. Inner desire, but yeah. the snake here is actually putting the temptation in front of it. So right. the first temptation is is done in that way. And it also says that when they eat, their eyes are opened and they, they realize things. So it's not like they instantly become evil, but they have the realization of what is good and evil. So some of this conversation is going to get to when we have this propensity or this desire is it coming from inside of us or is it coming from outside of us? And so we use, we use the term the world, and I think that's mm-hmm. a good term. But when we say the world, that can mean Satan, that can mean evil influencers. It can mean other people. That can mean <laughs> carnality, yeah. money. I mean, it, worldly desires take on a whole bunch of different things. And so this also changes because... In the Old Testament, they were not the temple of the Holy Spirit. And Mm -hmm. so the Holy Spirit was outside of them as an outside influencer, where now in the New Testament, we have Christ dwelling in us. It's an inside influencer. So this is like the the yetzer, the desire part of this is going to get more complicated because in the Old Testament, it was almost all external they would believe that there was really nothing inside of you that was drawing you. Everything that was drawing you was from the outside. Yet in the New Testament, now we have Jesus living inside of us, so that should be the primary draw in our mm-hmm. life because internally it should be stronger than the external. Yep. So um, when we look at basically verses, if we skip down from like verse 8 to 11, you kind of see there when... God comes after Adam and Eve, yeah. and and rather than them repenting, I mean, what if they repented? <laughs> right, you know, like right. like I think we would still be in Eden. Yeah. I think God is merciful and forgiving. Like we see that the whole Deuteronomy right. thirty two, like verses or sorry, um, Exodus thirty four six to eight, the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Yeah. We talked about that last a great question. time, and I'm like. But they start blaming each other, and they start blaming God. This is the woman you gave me. Right. This one did that. The snake did this. And All right, you're out of here. You're out of here. And so, <laughs> Take a so, walk. That, so rather than repenting and coming back into alignment with God, they start blaming each other and yeah. blaming God. Right. And then we get to verses 14 through 24, which some call the curse or what God brings as a result of, of their disobedience and not repenting. And, yeah. and this is long. I don't know that we need to read the whole thing. And so why don't we do this? Why don't we kind of take a time out? Genesis 3, 14 through 24. Just hit pause. And pause. Read, that. read it three times and read it carefully. And when you come back, we're just going to kind of give you some commentary, commentary, some thoughts on that. Yeah, so in this, some things we need to notice are that the things that are cursed are the Nahash, so the serpent, and the ground. Adam and Eve are not cursed. And we've said this many times throughout our videos that we need to keep pointing this out because people keep coming back to this view that Adam and Eve were cursed. And it doesn't say that. This is really important, especially when you talk about total depravity. depravity yep. And so the total depravity world is going to try to read something into Scripture that isn't there. Mm-hmm. They're, they're basically going to say Adam and Eve themselves were cursed and separated from God and now they can no longer get to that now there is some truth there you might have been saying that in your you know past steps to salvation for a long time but you got to be careful i said that in the last Mm -hmm. video that some of those things that are 
rotely in our mind, we need to deprogram mm -hmm. a little bit because you're you're saying them in a way that theologically mm -hmm. might not be very accurate. Yeah, I wrote, I wrote this big paper on atonement, and I pointed that out many times that when it talks about the curse and atonement, it's the curse of the law, not the curse of Adam and Eve, because there was no curse given to Adam and Eve. There was the curse of the ground and the curse on the Satan, yeah. <laughs> the Nahash. Yep. And so uh, the next thing is, is the very first thing we see in here is God gives a promise that he's going to deliver them through the seed of the woman yeah. by the seed of the woman crushing the head of the serpent. And if we get anything with our atonement theologies, we should usually look at the first thing communicated in the Bible, and the first thing communicated is a Christus Victor theme. Yeah, yeah. So, exactly. That's that. Love that. And so also we see, yes, the pain of childbearing will yeah. increase. There are going to, it's going to be thorns and thistles, which will make cultivation harder. Um, there will be inequality because of their rebellion of men trying to rule over women, women's desire being toward man. This isn't our primary message here, uh -huh. but you know Matt and I, I don't like to use the word egalitarian because it's kind of gotten some bad things, but we believe in total biblical equality. We mm -hmm. believe that in Eden there is equality. In the, uh, in the last Eden, the first two chapters of the Bible and the last two chapters, it's going to come back to that. We're messed up in the middle, but this is one of the things in Eden that, that seemingly is going to be Loss. This is not God's ideal. It's it's a infraction of the worldliness that yeah. comes into yeah, it. Yeah, it's yeah, it's not God's ideals, like you said. Um, and notice what it also says here is that um, God says that they have become like us, knowing good and evil. So if we say that they have become like us, and if the like and if the thing they become is totally depraved, does that mean God's totally depraved? Right. No. <laughs> I'm like you can't that. read that into the text. This is probably one of the biggest struggles in this text is essentially Adam and Eve were not like the spiritual beings. The Nahash says, if you eat from the tree, now you'll be, be like, like us. the spiritual beings. And then it's sort of quantified that now you've eaten, now you're, you're like, like us. us. Yeah. And so you would think, wouldn't that be a good thing? Wouldn't, wouldn't that be good to be like the spiritual beings? And so for many years... I mean, thousands of years, people have been hashing through this saying, you know, was God protecting Adam and Eve? That's mm -hmm. what Eden was. It was a, you know, protective mountaintop temple, so to speak. Also makes you question, like, what about everybody else? Did, yeah. did they know or not later? You know, things yeah, like that. Yeah, from, so. from them. Yeah, that, that gets into some intertestamental stuff. Speculate on that, where the, the sons of God at the Genesis 6, 6 thing was also not just about the the Nephilim stuff, but also about the purveying of um, divine wisdom that they should not have had. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's a whole lot in that in the intertestamental literature. Verse 22 kind of says to live forever, and that people have gotten hung up with that. So Matt made a point that only God is eternal. So, you know, when you say live forever, that's not... We think of that as eternality, but like I said... The rest of the Old Testament, Matt said there's clues in here, and this would be mm -hmm. one of those clues, but some people would question whether that was really ever the plan to live forever. So most most Hebraic backgrounds would say that wasn't the original plan, that we would live forever. And that's, you might not get this, but that's why some traditional Jews aren't going to be able to do the New Testament thing, because this whole idea now of being regrafted into this eternal forever kind of living historically didn't really exist within the Old Testament. They didn't really know. Now they're, they're the rest of life thought that way. You look at the mm -hmm. Egyptian or Canaanite yeah. culture and I mean what did the pharaohs believe? They believed that they if they were good enough they would eventually become gods yeah. they would they would become eternal so to mm -hmm. speak so there's arguments going back and forth but i'm just going to say when you when you read this carefully and again i i mean we could really dive into this and talk forever just about mm -hmm. verse 22 but i'm just saying like there needs to be a little bit of decompartmentalizing this because what you've always been told or what you've always thought may not actually be the way it really yeah, is. Yeah, there's a whole lot of different views in the Jewish interpretation that go back a long time yeah. uh, on yeah. this, and even in the early church right. um, also. So uh, back to the tree. 
So God mercifully separates Adam and Eve so they won't live forever in this state, which is exactly what the text says. Yeah. And we don't, we shouldn't take this then as like, this is God's wrath, you know? Right, right. Like, but him separating them so that, and it talks about then the rescue. Yeah. Like, you know, the crushing the head of the serpent so that they wouldn't live forever that way. Because remember, God's life, the tree of life, was sustaining them in their mortality. Yeah, and this kind of starts getting into a Romans 5 and 7, maybe 8, mm -hmm. maybe 11. Yeah. I mean, they're all kind of tied in here of, of the whole thing that death coming into the world and yeah. what that looks That's like. That's what Romans 5 is all about. It's not that um, we inherited Adam's guilt, right. the wrong way Augustine read it, but it's that we all inherit death because we have been separated through Adam and Eve from the tree of life. Yep. Yep. And that's what we inherit. And so you kind of get into this death or this separation and eternal life is partaking in God's life. And so at the beginning, you get this idea of Adam and Eve being in the presence of God, walking hand in hand at this fall that's removed, but someday it will be restored. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's like the whole view of salvation, um, especially in the Orthodox Church. And I met with, uh, had lunch with a guy that I met who's an Orthodox priest yesterday. And it was it was great. Uh, we had great conversation. He pointed this out that all of salvation is really just our partaking in God's life, and so we become more like God's life. And we yeah. had like a whole like conversation on the Orthodox view of salvation versus evangelical view of salvation. It, it was it was fantastic. Yeah, and the the Hebraic thought goes very much into the Orthodox thought. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So let's talk, let's get a little more into the Yetzer, the, the Jewish view of what desire is. Matt, why don't you kind of start us off there and I'll chime in. Yeah, so the thing is, um, so Adam and Eve eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The thing is, when you have the knowledge of something, then you can have the desire for it. If you don't have the knowledge of it, you won't desire it. Right. And that's the whole thing of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, is yep. now that we know about what good and evil is, we can have the desire to do one or the other. And that's different. That's what you and I believe. Uh -huh. All of Judaism believes. Most, 99% of the early church thought. Oh, yep. Yet, Calvinists and Reformed theology uh -huh. thinks different about this. Yeah, so even like R.C. Sproul said that God's just punishment to us for eating from the tree was to give us original sin and basically almost dis... Um, basically destroy our desire to want anything good and that's opposite of what the text says and it's funny because i love the rhetoric of rc Sproul. like yeah, i yeah, think he is one of the great most communicator convincing people to ever communicate the word of god i remember when i was young i would listen to his stuff and the first time i listened to it if you don't hear the other side you just you'd think mm -hmm. that's good that's it that's yeah. the truth but the other side when you start looking through it like we're doing today, you, you get the other view that that doesn't really add up. But yep. we'll get there. And so, yeah, in the Genesis account, we saw that, um, all we saw was that they now have the knowledge of good and evil, and thus they could act upon either. And that's what happened. Now they have the knowledge. They, they become like when a, a child starts realizing what they're doing. They're innocent up to yeah. that point when they realize that, oh, well, this is that, then, then they're when they become older, they're then accountable for yes. it. Yes. So, so in the Old Testament, there's essentially this idea that at the tree, they were given the desire. And mm -hmm. so they have a desire, you might call it a propensity, to go one way or the other. And remember, everything is external in the Old Testament. And so, so they themselves, they had a mind, they wouldn't have argued that, so they're thinking about it and they're making decisions but every influence would have been an outside influence. Where today, particularly Plato did this to us, that we are almost gods ourselves and mm -hmm. that you know everything is inside of us and that very little is external. And so don't get caught up in that. So think more of the Jewish view, the Yetzer. So the Yetzer is the desire itself. Mm -hmm. Now, the words here is going to be Yetzer Ha-Tov, Yetzer Ha-Tov, you kind of all run together yeah. when you say it together like that. And so the Yetzer Tov is going to be the propensity or the desire to do good. Now, the Judaic view would believe that that's what you were created with. with. 
that that's what was in you from the very beginning. And so when they say the tree of good and evil, tov and ra, you're going to have this desire now the, or the knowledge to see the difference. And so the most popular view is that before the tree, you only had propensity for the good. Mm -hmm. And that's why sometimes people get stuck in thinking it's a tree of evil. Yeah. And when what did Eve, when she saw the tree, what did she say? It was delightful to the eyes. Yeah. It looked like it was good to eat. So yeah. she saw the good of the tree. Right. <laughs> right? And so, so it's the propensity to do good, yet when you add the evil into that, now you're going to have a strained desire. You're not just going to have the one, you're going to have a double. And so the other one is Yetzer Hara. And so... That's the, that's the propensity to do evil. And so this is a constant struggle. And this is where I really want to be careful because, again, in the Judaic circles, there are so many different theories of this. And um, what, what doesn't work is we're, and I've even used this illustration and made some of my more traditional friends upset, is the Tom and Jerry view, I yeah, call the it. The angel, angel over here, the little yeah. demon angel over here, you know, and they're kind of going back and forth talking their external sources you know kind of influencing where you go but I or we use that illustration because people just get it from an mm -hmm. early age when you're a child you understood that there was a propensity something pulling you this way or that way and you needed to decide which way to go and so at a very basic view of the Yetzers is you've been given a knowledge and now something's pulling you this way or that way. But the desire itself, the yetzer, isn't bad. It's neutral. And the words in Hebrew tell you this, that uh -huh. there's a there's a good desire and there's a bad desire. So there's a yetzer atov and there's a yetzer hara. Uh -huh. And so you're going to have the same desire that's sort of pulling you both ways. And this is the crazy thing about it is... Even the desire or the propensity, the pull towards evil can glorify God. That's, that's the part that people get wrong on this, mm -hmm. is that when, when I'm drawn to the worldliness over there in a Judaic mindset, if I don't go that way, it makes God smile. That's mm -hmm. the easiest way to say it. Yeah. So it's, it's not... Ignore the temptation. Yes, it's not the the evil itself that is bad in fact you know this is this is where you get into this like you know did god is god the author of evil and you know some some judaic even though they're not reformed they might believe that god is sovereign over purpose, everything yeah. yeah that has used it to serve a purpose or whatever and so again this is complicated with the yes. different views and it's not just reformed theology and not i mean most the great majority of ancient Hebraic thought is far from Reformed theology, mm -hmm. yet you still have this view of God's sovereignty that could even put him as the author of evil. And in that way, Reformed... You kind of see this the in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Yassian yes. community especially. Yes. We're more deterministic, but not deterministic in the sense of like modern Calvinists. Yeah. <laughs> they were very yeah. different. <laughs> so, yeah. but. so you want to see it as you know more of a desire, and we're going to get into different viewpoints or scriptures on this in a second but one of the one of the places where you see this is Deuteronomy 6 5 so I want to take just a little field trip and start this with Deuteronomy 6 5 and and so the reason why this is important is because most of you would know it as the Shema this is the resuscitation the probably three times a day this is what we do this is where we're going and even though like Matt and I are not traditional Jews, the whole idea of the Torah was to keep you on a better path before the yep. Messiah yep. got there. It was a shadow that pointed you to the Messiah. And today, I hate to say it, but I think we need that path better than Ever. any other time. Yeah. yeah. So so it's still good. So what most of you know about Deuteronomy 6.5 is love Yahweh, the Lord your God, with all your heart. And so in Hebrew, when you get into this, the all your heart is bakol lavavka. Bakol lavavka. Now, I get that that doesn't really mean much to you, but it's the yetzer hatov, 
the good part plus the Yetzer Hara. And so that's the heart. And when you read this in Hebrew, there's a redundant bet. And so it's Lamed, it's a double bet bet. And so it's a, it's kind of a love the Lord with all your heart heart. Mm -hmm. What would that mean? What was this a screw up? Did the did some scribe write heart twice? No, it's it's this idea that we're talking about of the yetzer of the two. The two. The 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 two external, you're gonna love this and love that, but you can love him in both inclinations or desires. And so even though you're gonna fall to the you know the the the, the hurrah, <laughs> you're you're not gonna get there. If, if you have that in control, if you live a life of devotion to muscle management of continually saying no to that, that gives glory to the Lord. So even your, not only your good desire, but your... your yeah, the resisting of temptation. Resisting is going to, yeah, is going to yeah. give desire at the same way. Yep. So there's sort of an idiom that rabbis would use, and they would say, let the anguish of your yetzer hara become the source of blessing Hashem. And so what, what that meant in almost every traditional Jew, as I say this, would understand, and it gets said a few different ways like that, but would understand that both of these desires are given to give glory to God. That, that it isn't something that you can't get out of. It's your decision, it's your, your management to work through that. It would be it would be crazy to say to them, well, there's nothing you can do about the, the yeah. Yetzer Hurrah. Like that, that's just... Yeah, you're totally depraved. You can't <laughs> do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that would... all of the Old Testament... Speaks against speaks that. Speaks against that. Mm -hmm. And so this is where, like, I've had conversations with, with some, some reformed circles and definitely Calvinists and said, what do you do with the Old Testament? Like your theology, like the whole Old Testament talks about this desire to go one way and that's what devotion to the Lord is and honoring them that way. That how do you just not look at the whole Old Testament that way? And yeah. I think that is probably, again, not dissecting the Old Testament from the New Testament is probably one of the biggest, if, if it were the only reason to not go Reformed, that would be enough in my mind. Yeah. And so I like to call this that that we are the battlefield, but we're not the combatant. And that's why uh, Expedition 44 kind of is a playoff of Psalm 144. And some, sometimes my when fingers for war. people get into it, they think that's, oh, they're gun guys, you know, which is true. I'm a gun guy. Matt's not. Matt's pacifist. <laughs> but he shoots occasionally, though. I'll get him out there. And so, so anyway... <laughs> That's what 144 is really talking about, is, is David saying, like, I'm not the combatant here. Yeah, yeah and actually <laughs> when he's saying train my fingers, it's teaching him, like, yeah. like it's musical. He's talking yeah. about his harp a couple of verses later, about how he's playing skillfully. <laughs> so Deuteronomy 6.5 is, is sort of the, the verse, and we read Deuteronomy 30 yesterday. Both of these are hugely instrumental to the devotion of the Torah of the Old Testament of the whole thing and that gives way into the Messiah. Jesus did this. Jesus lived yeah. this way. Yeah. Yep. And so a, a few other things just to notice, uh, like we've been talking about these desires, the, the Yetzer, and like how they can go either way. And I mean, God, uh, let's think of it this way. Like eating is a good thing. God told of Adam and Eve to eat from yeah. any of the trees Appetite. in the garden except yeah. for the one. And yet we can take that desire of... Uh, and the thing of sustaining us, which is good, or even enjoying the taste of food, and we can abuse that and become gluttons, or we could go the other way, even with it, and become uh, with anorexia and bulimic, bulimic stuff. And then the same thing with sex. I mean, he told them be fruitful yeah. and multiply, right. and that's great to enjoy that and enjoy intimacy with your spouse and have it's a family. An appetite, a desire. But it could yeah. go into what lust and rape and all this other stuff. The yeah. abuse of yeah. of that. And so you can, it just shows right from the beginning that God, God had this intention of the Yetzer, Hara, Yetzer Hatov, Yetzer Hara. Yeah. And it's also interesting to think about, you know, the, the sexual part of it is most people today just believe that, like, men have this, you know, appetite for that that can never really be quenched. And, like, 
some of that, you kind of wonder like how much of that came with this tree. Too. Yeah. So again, we we can't have every conversation. Yeah, everyone. Today, yeah. But yep. that's some of the thinking in it. Yeah. So let's go through some more Old Testament stuff on the Yetzer. Uh, we see it right away after the the garden um, in Genesis. Four verse six through seven with Cain, yep. um, and it says this. It says, "Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at your door, and its desire is for you, but you must master over it." Right. So, so God is telling Cain that you have this desire, but don't be mastered by it. Don't give in to the yetzer hara. Yeah. So, would God tell Cain something that he couldn't do? He's, he's actually shepherding Cain on how to honor him, yes. building this muscle memory. If you want to honor me, you've got these desires in you, and this side of the desire, you're going to honor me when you don't go that way. Yep. Um, in Isaiah 26, 3, it says, You have kept him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. And I love this because the perfect peace is the is the balance of shalom that yeah. we're talking about. So if the you want, of chaos. yeah, if you want to live out of the chaotic circles in peace in your life, then it means you need to develop this propensity to do good or that comes to by trusting in the Lord. Yeah, trust in the Lord, master the outside influences. Yep. basically. Um, I love this one. First Chronicles twenty eight nine. Um, this is David talking to Solomon. It says, as for you, my son Solomon, know the God of your father and serve him with your whole heart and with a willing mind for the Lord searches all hearts. He understands every intent, that's Yetzer there, yep. of your thoughts. If you seek him, he will let you find him. But if you forsake him, he will reject you forevermore. Yeah, so this is thoughts, ambitions. Yep. Um, so this one is, um, here we have Yetzer that's about that. There are... It, it points out right in here, there's evil inclinations, there's good inclinations, yep. depending on what you take. He indicates that you are able to serve the Lord with your desires willingly. Yeah. And so it's not a total depravity verse whatsoever. Right. Now the next one is Genesis 6-5, and Calvinists kind of take Genesis 6-5 and, and God's comments to kind of use that as a... As proof a text. Proof text. And again, that's really... It's so funny because often in theology, when you hear the main text, you, you think they say things, and then when you go back and read them, you're like, that's it? That's all it says? And this is kind of one of those moments. Yep, so Genesis 6, 5, Then the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and every intent, yet sir, of the thoughts of his hearts was only evil, raw, continually. Yeah. So we got, here we got, um, basically they'll talk about, uh, okay, from... From birth, they'll say, from birth, see, this is the proof text, they're only, they're evil from birth, their yeah. thoughts are only yeah. evil, um, but I think that we need to keep reading here, what yeah. does, this is like right before the flood, what does, yep. how does God explain this same thought, these are kind of the bookmarks, like right. the, the book ends yep. of, of this whole story yep. um, of the flood, and what does God say, he expands on that same thought in, in Genesis 821. Yeah. Um, that says the Lord smelled the soothing aroma and the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of man for the intent, yet sir, of man's heart is evil, raw, from his youth. That's important. Yeah. We'll get into that in a second. And I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. Okay, so yet sir, evil, from his youth, not or. It doesn't say that he was born evil. No. Nope. I think this is important in that what what a Calvinist view would say is that from inside the womb, once the once the once that happens, every person is bad, and that's the, we're going to get into this with babies pretty soon. Yep, but next like, episode. <laughs> that's what it would mean. What this is saying is different than that. That that Hebrew word not or is is saying that from the youth and usually when we think of youth we don't think about infants or babies we think of like teenage years yeah, yeah. and so this is actually used of the age that david fought goliath in first samuel 17:33. it's the age that men get married in proverbs 5 18 and i and in isaiah 54 6 and in malachi 2 14 and it's the age of parents in psalm 127 4. so there's a really interesting take on this is that you're 
those things are let into your life during your youth. And so when that, again, we're going to get into the babies thing, but like it definitely does not say according to all these texts that you are born with this, that you are yeah. like that from the beginning. It's, it's saying that those things, those external sources are going to be the one that influence that you influence and you, then yes. it's going to become your habits and your character. And so it's something that's happening from your youth that you act upon in the future is really what what this text is saying. And so when God repeats basically what the same thing that he said in Genesis 6, 5 down in Genesis 8, 21, he is saying that this isn't something they're born evil with, but it's something that they become by entertaining the Yetzer Hara. <laughs> And this is where the New Testament really, we're about to get into the New mm -hmm. Testament, and this is where the New Testament is going to go side by side with this. In fact, most of Paul's writings are going to speak from this Old Testament paradigm that we're talking about today. And I know Romans is complicated with yep. who wrote it, but you got Paul connected somewhere in there. But anyway, the, the, the influencer, the writer, the scribe of Romans, when you get into Romans, you know, eight, Romans seven, some, somewhere in there, you're you're gonna kind of end up that this this propensity to continue to sin is going to make you worldly. If you keep giving into that, you're going to be more of the world than of God. And sometimes we call that carnal Christianity. We're gonna we're gonna say, well, they're still Christians. They're just very much worldly. in the world. But it's really interesting, and this is where I've, I've written two books on discipleship here, and I'm working on a third on it, and I'm not convinced that that was part of the group, especially when you read in the Old Testament, like, you know, you go back to the flood passages, and, you know, none were righteous. It means except that, for Noah. Except for Noah. So they had the propensity of sin that they kept mm -hmm. giving into over and yeah. over. And today... That's the interesting thing also is that he called Noah righteous yeah. <laughs> in that yeah. section. Yeah. So. And so if you give in over and over, if you give in more to the inclination of the Yetzer Hara than you do of the, the Tov part of it, then there's this question mark of which side of the fence are you really in? And I don't want to draw a line of salvation right now. I think too many people do, do that, that, try yeah. to say, well, where am that's I? That's up to God. Where are you? That, that, that's above our pay grade, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, so I don't want to do that, but I'm just saying the, the Old Testament, the Hebraic thought of it would be that if you're not consistently in devotion to keeping these things in check, if you're more of the world than of God, then you're not set apart or in a discipleship before the Lord. And going back into the 6-5, you would have been deemed as unrighteous, not righteous. Yep. Um, so let's jump into the New Testament. And the New Testament word, uh, basically for Yetzer, is epithumia. And what we see there is, so we talk about this all the time, is that most of the New Testament were written by people who are in Though they're in a Roman Greek culture, they're thinking Hebrew. Yep. And so that word, when we see epithumia, in the New Testament, you should think yetzer. Yep. Um, so let's just go first, which is the desire, right with the words of Jesus, when he's telling the parable of the sower, yep. um, Mark 4.19 says, But the worries of the world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires, the epithumia, yep. yetzer there, for the things enter in and choke out the word, and it becomes unfruitful. So the question I always ask, and people get hung up on this, is why is the soil unfruitful? Because of the the propensity, the desire, the desires, going after the wrong yeah. desires. Yeah, the wrong desire is what makes it unfruitful. It's what you act upon. Uh, Here's yeah. another one. Yep. This is John 8, 44. You are of your father the devil, and you want to do the desires, the yetzer, of your father. Boy, does that sound like we were like we were born with it again? This is this is a proof text, and so this is you were you are of the Father. Now it doesn't say you're born. Yeah, your desires. Your desires just line up with the the who your father is, and that is the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning, and does not stand in you know the beginning here again. This is more 
more directive to that word youth we just talked about than it was from birth. Yep. There, if you wanted to say birth, there's other, there's yeah. better words he could have used yeah. for birth. But yeah, he probably would have been noir. But he doesn't and, use that. Yeah. yeah. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So this is directed to the Pharisees. He's saying that they are of the devil because they act on the desi same desires as, as the devil. Yeah. That, that that's, they're patterning themselves after the world instead of after God. Here's another one. Luke twenty two fifteen. I have earnestly desired, epithumia, yet, sir, to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. So if these desires, as Calvinist says, are totally depraved, and Jesus has desires, does that mean Jesus is totally depraved? See, Jesus has a desire here. Right. It's the same word that's being used for all of this that Calvinists say is evil. Yes. But this is Jesus' desire. He's saying that Jesus has the same thing. So this is this is so important, what mm -hmm. Matt just said. I mean, this is this is the hinge of it, and this is why I say you gotta be your theology has to agree. If you're gonna go go take on a whole doctrine of something, there can't be something that throws you under the bus. And this is in Calvinist thinking, this is a very difficult passage. Yes. This is a throw you under the bus passage. Yep. Um, so James 1, 13 through 15, I think sums this entire thing up yep. of our desires and where they come from. And that it says, let no one say he is tempted when he is tempted, saying that I am tempted by God because God cannot be tempted with evil and he does not tempt anyone. Also, we've done a whole series on James yep. and dug into yep. this so you can guys can go look at our James chapter one. One of my favorite thing. series. It yeah. was a great series. Yeah. So says, we get but, really into this. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, but each person is tempted when he is lured away and enticed by his own desire. Epithumia Yetzer. This then the desire, the Yetzer again, when it is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's fully grown, gives birth to death. Yeah. So what we have there is that these desires, we can act upon them, and when we act upon them, they grow into something that brings death. Yep. So yeah. Um, let's look at the eye a little bit because this is really connected to the Yetzer. Like yep. this, this concept of the eye in Hebrew thought was like it. It's very much of the 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 mirror to what's inside of it. The mirror to your desire. So most people know this or the window, today I would is say. yeah the window is window, better yeah, that you can you can you hear oftentimes look into their eyes. You know I mm -hmm. tell my boys all the time when when you introduce yourself to somebody. Give them a firm handshake look and them look the them deep in the eye because that relates to truth. It mm -hmm. relates to character. It brings into all those things. Third world country, I remember the first time I ever went to Ecuador. I was I was in this place that didn't have cars or anything. We were in like a, uh, not the tourist market, but the real person market and, you know, looking at all the different things there and nobody would look you in the eye. And... And I remember somebody saying to me, don't look them in the eye. Like that's very disrespectful to like look somebody into the eye because it's almost like this intimate interaction mm -hmm. into their soul, so to speak. Yeah. Um, and so sometimes desire is connected with the eye yep. as well. Um, tov A-N and A-N Torah, tor yeah. basically Tova. And so which was a person who looked at others sometimes with compassion, sometimes with evil, depending right. on, on which which side of the Tobin Ra you're, right, you're, exactly. you're working at. Um, it could be someone who's acting in the Tov side as being a generous, compassionate, loving person. Um, and I think Jesus even gets to this also when it's about the formation of our character yep. and that when uh, Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, the eye is the lamp of the body. So then if your eye is clear, Tov, right. he's saying there, then your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, Ra, your whole body will be full of darkness. Then the light that is in you is darkness. How great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And you probably actually don't know this, but there's a Hebrew idiom called the apple of, of your eye. eye. Yep. And we get that in English. Like, that's a Hebrew one that's made its way to English, even though there aren't a lot of those. This is one of them. And so 
think about that for a minute. What does it mean that somebody is the apple of your eye? It's a play on desire. Yeah. It goes back it's to the desire of your eye. What does your eye see? It goes back and to the garden. It goes back to the garden. And it also goes back to this third world country thing of that if you if you look deeply into somebody's eye, then that shows that you have desire for right. them. The, 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 and not just for them, but to their innermost being. It's mm. a very relational, uh, internal thing. And that's another reason why, you know, that the apple is obviously a play on the garden of yeah. where where is your desire. And so um, the New Testament talks, as, as we've said, just a ton about training your eye. And that is the devotion, the Torah, the propensity that the eyes are sort of the gates. What comes in, mm -hmm. what goes out, garbage in, garbage out, that yep. kind of thing. And so the idea of training your eyes towards the good desire, this whole concept doesn't work in Calvinistic thinking. Yeah, Jesus even here says, seems like you can train your eye to be good or not based on if you let light in or if you let darkness in, and then that forms your character rather than I'm born totally depraved and I can't do any good. Right. <laughs> right? And so work. it doesn't work that way. So Paul often refers to this same thing as called the flesh and the spirit. Yep. In the New Testament, we get this in Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 I'll to 10. I'll read that. It says, Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap eternal life. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have the opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are of the household of the faith. Yeah. So I don't know how you can read this with a Calvinistic bent. No. This is really a hard like, one. What, yeah. what do you so do? <laughs> right. I mean, it's, it's, it's a great picture of the Yetzer Hatab, right. Yetzer Hara, and the importance of sowing into good things because it will develop good character, good habits, more Christ-likeness, um, but not sowing into evil, the evil inclination, but resisting the temptation to do that because the thing you, the thing you feed is going to grow, basically, is what it's saying here. So this is where it's a continual like denial thing. So mm -hmm. this is in, in Hebraic thought, what this meant is it was a story that basically was reaffirming what everybody would say. So your Yetzer Hara makes the denial of that as you train yourself that way to not be influenced by that external source. It's going to make your Yetzer Hatav stronger okay. yep and i believe james says this great in james four seventeen. so whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it for him it is sin <laughs> so, yep. so it's yep. about knowing and it's about doing so that's pretty much what the bible said we've connected the old testament thoughts which again like mm -hmm. it's all over the old testament i mean almost every psalm speaks to this but it's also in the New Testament. Like, mm -hmm. like Matt said, it's uh, the New Testament, they're thinking very Hebraically, and when you think this way, it ties it all in. So now, let's circle back to where we started yesterday and talk yeah. about Augustine and concupiscence. concupiscence. Yeah. There you go. yeah, so what, um, what in Hebrew is the yetzer, and in Greek is apothumia, when translated into Latin, that's concupiscence. Which is a problem. Yes, so we talked about concupiscence. So concupiscence is basically the word for yetzer, but in Latin. And so we've already seen here, um, the yetzer and the epithumia are completely neutral. Um, they have a neutral meaning in Greek and Hebrew that you can act in a good way toward it or act in a bad way. But in Latin, concupiscence always has a negative meaning. Yeah. I've struggled with this one for a long time. Like we languages have definitely changed, and so mm -hmm. words that originally meant something have changed. I, mm -hmm. I I would say this with the word perfect, and I've I've yeah done a lot of yeah, study we did a on, whole that. Episode on that. Exactly <laughs> that like the way we think of it now, Plato, you know, according to Plato, Platonic views on it is very mm -hmm. different from what it was probably written at. Is that the case for this word and? I mean, there's very little to say that that is the case. I would say from the very beginning, it had a negative connotation. To yeah, it. I mean, from in Latin, it's a translation from the Greek and from the Hebrew, 
um, but it has in in that Latin culture it had a negative meaning. It would be like for us today if we use the word consequence. We always think that consequence is a bad thing, right? right? But I could say the consequence of my hard work at my job earned me a bonus. Yeah. It was something that came out of me doing something. Yeah. It could be good or bad, but because of this, in our culture, consequence usually has a negative thing of a punishment. It's a great illustration. So if you look it up in the dictionary, it doesn't necessarily have a negative connotation but to it. But the way it. we use it on streets, in the street, right. is always negative. And that could be very similar to this word, except this word almost always. In fact, I say almost just because you might find something out yeah. there. I haven't found that. But but sometimes when we say these videos and I say mm -hmm. almost always, you know, I'm just going to throw it out there. Maybe you'll find that, but I haven't found that. I found that it's always negative. And because of that, when Augustine does it this way, it's going to continue completely change the mm -hmm. view of desire to not make them a desire that can honor God both ways, but to make one completely evil from the beginning of time as the way you were mm -hmm. designed and the other not. Yeah, and remember, Augustine couldn't read Hebrew or Greek, so he only was dealing with this Latin interpretation of this word. Yeah. And so, and then it brought this thing of original sin. And remember, he also dealt with like that Greek sex culture and he was really yeah. into it before his conversion and was really hammering against kind of his major temptation of that. And so concupiscence comes from, we get our word concubine from it. Yeah. Um, and so he basically had this, this, this base sexual desire in the transmission of sin through the procreative act. And then the original sin is off to the races. Now, if you are connecting dots, if you watched our last episode and you're mm -hmm. connecting the dots here, I think your logic, your philosophical ideas are starting to put this together, but I want to connect some dots. So yes, the, the, the last video we did, we did a portion where we said, here are some logical or philosophical problems you're going to have if you go this, this way. way, talking about mm -hmm. uh, a reformed bend. And this gets into that too, because as you're noticing, if you believe, as the as the Calvinistic side does, that from the very beginning you have a propensity or a desire for evil that that's innately built into you, according to Adam, you're going to have a problem then when it comes to this idea that some people, this is the pronoun conversation, that some people were are just built like this from birth. And this is interesting that the reformed world is going to fight those views. Mm -hmm. They're going to tooth and nail say, no, you weren't designed that way. You've made the choices to be mm -hmm. that way. But then they deny you can actually make the choice. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so it doesn't work. If you're of a Calvinistic bent and you believe innately all those things were handed off to you from Adam, yet you're fighting that people were design that way from the beginning you have a problem where my personal view would say that all of these things these desires you give into them over and over and over you weren't built like that from the very beginning that's going to line up a whole lot better with the idea that people today are making lifestyle decisions they're choosing to go that way they weren't God didn't design them that way. That's what I believe. If you believe differently than that, that's another. I'd love to have a rabbinical uh, Shabbat conversation, conversation with you on that one. All right, but let's look at what 1 John 3, 7 to 8 says. It says, little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he, he's talking about God there, is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning, again, the, the whole thing of noir yeah. there, uh, the, the Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. This is the part in the episode where I start feeling like it's a broken record, <laughs> where I start to feel like we're beating a dead, dead horse, horse here. But we want to show to you it says it over and over and over <laughs> in the Bible. <laughs> yeah. Right. So would we need to be deceived if we were already born sinners? And totally depraved. It, like we're already born deceived. It, if you just think through this, it wouldn't make any sense. Yeah. And so practice here indicates that it's something that we can do. It's muscle memory. Yep. We have the choice on what desires we can act upon, and that builds our character. 
So what about Romans 3? That's I'm going to play the devil's advocate right. here. And you say, Romans 3, none are righteous, no, not one. So I think we need to keep this in context here. What's the context of Romans? So Romans chapter 1, we see Paul kind of coming against Gentiles, yep. right? Yep. And then Romans 2 and 3, he's coming against the Jews. And he shows how both of them have not have gone astray. They have both both not image God. And when it yep. talks about righteous here, if you go look up all those Old Testament quotations, it's all according to the law, yeah. right? They're not righteous according to the law. They have not completely obeyed the law. It's not saying that they're born totally depraved. Right. <laughs> I'm like, that is not the context. After that, when he, he ends this whole section saying that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Notice, three, yep. have, have, yeah, have is important. important. Yep. It's something that they have become. It's not all were born sinners short of the glory of God. And it's interesting that almost... I mean, you're the expert on Romans here. I, I feel like I can hardly say anything because we need to do a video on Romans <laughs> yeah, it's here. Still a series. series. <laughs> yeah, but, but anyway, um, Romans, in fact, I, th that's just an interesting thing. That's actually how like I kind of came to know Matt because one of my friends went to his Wednesday night Class. study on Romans and said, Boy, that Matt guy is amazing. I went to his Romans class. I learned more in a night than I learned on Romans my whole life. Da 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 da. And then that led to a bonfire conversation and about we the week after. became great friends. Yeah. So <laughs> that was like six years ago. Anyway, Matt knows <laughs> Romans. I'm just gonna leave it at that. But but Romans, sort of the theme of it is humans being weak in flesh. Yeah, and so that this whole thing here describes that we're the. Humanity has gone after has exercised more of the Yetzer Hara, and because Paul describes this as being weak in the flesh, right. it's not because of Adam's guilt. It's just because we, of the systems, of the principalities and powers, of whatever you want to say around it, we have the propensity to go after the things that are not of God. So when I read Romans, I think you just actually said Romans and Paul in the same sentence. Yeah. We, we argue love, about this one all the time. I, oh, I'm definitely a Paul. <laughs> and so... Uh, I would say 90% of scholars are. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, so when, when you read Romans, it would, be, it would be very hard to read this from an, innately, an innate standpoint. Like, if that's really the context of what the Bible was saying, you almost wouldn't need the book of Romans mm. because the book of Romans is basically trying to talk about this back and forth like thing of continually living in devotion, living a set apart life of discipleship. Yep. Um, so one of the most common proof texts for total depravity is found in Ephesians chapter two, verses one to three. Um, and, but it's really better a proof text proving this whole concept of the Yetzer that we've been talking about. And it says, and you were dead in your transgressions, trespasses and sins, sorry, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air and of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, including the desires, that's epithemia, yep. of the flesh and of the mind, and we were children of wrath, even as the rest. So let's break this down. By so, nature, so by nature, children. By nature. So no. verse one, this is this is where I go back to the the writing, the authorship of the Bible, especially in these New Testament, you know, more epistle style writings, are going to be very careful in the way that things are worded. I, I believe that that was inspired. That they spent a whole lot of time, like really cleverly writing exactly how and what they wanted to say so he has the opportunity in verse one to say that we were born this way mm -hmm. yet that's not the way it's worded yeah it says we became dead at some point this is basically what it says that we it says that you were dead i mean it seems like in the way that the the greek is there it's something that you became yeah you yeah. became dead verse two defines sin as being as in the way that we're walking according to the world, walking according yep. to the prince of the power of the air, Satan. Not that we were born this way, but it's an action, a choice that we did. It was our will that we were, we chose to walk in this pattern. It was our will, and I love that you use the word pattern, because again, that goes back into that muscle memory, that mm -hmm. are you going to follow these patterns, or are you going to follow those patterns? And Hebraically, again, with shalom and balance and peace and getting out of chaos, mm -hmm. like, this is the recipe to do it, is you continually 
make decisions that are angled towards the Lord rather than towards the world. Yeah, and when we get to verse 3, it elaborates on this, talking about that we were living according to the lust of our flesh. Again, that's the yetzer hara, the yeah. desires of our flesh. Yep. And when verse 3 says that we are by nature children of wrath, it's uh, phesis here, which means by their designation. It's because they're walking this way that they're designated that this is their trajectory, is that you're children of wrath because you're on this path. Now this really fits in with our concept of wrath. And so if you're if you're taking more of a Calvinistic bent on wrath, what you're what you're saying is that wrath means that God gets in a fury or upset. Yeah, yeah. because you're born totally depraved. <laughs> and and so he has wrath from birth against you. That, that God is going to actually do something against you, basically. Mm -hmm. Where if you read it this way, what, what falls into that is that you're being handed over because you've repeatedly made poor decision after poor decision. Your desires, your yet, sir, has been of the world. Mm -hmm. And so eventually God's just going to say, hey, if you keep doing this, I'm going to stop trying to steer you the other way. I'm just going to hand you over and let you fall into the consequences of your repeated patterns and decisions. Yep. And so following this, if you keep reading Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 on it it speaks of god's salvation in jesus and how we're actually destined for good works not yeah. evil works and to walk in those good works yeah and that's kind of again going back to the old testament again like i'm just sorry i feel like this is a broken record over mm -hmm. and over but again that's going to say if your decisions continually are for the good you're pleasing to god even when you make decisions that are yet or hurrah, the, the not so great decisions, that still, those decisions centered around that and the way that you, you work to that is still going to point towards God. So you kind of get back into that Hebrew idiom of you want to walk with God, return mm -hmm. to peripateo yeah. thinking. Yep, and that's that Hebrew idiom for walking in, walking in the way of life. Yeah, um, it's, it's all connected. Yeah. And so this is, again, like this is, so hard to do in one episode to show you all the connections but like myself somebody who's been into the hebrew bible and i mean i've spent my life studying the connections like this isn't even a conversation yeah. like the, i have a hard time even like trying to be open to another view because when you read the old testament like this over and over and over like it it would be very hard to insert this idea that you were born this way or that that's just who you are yeah. like nobody n none of the none of the ancients none of the those with hebraic thoughts none of the rabbis would ever view it that way i don't know of one that would read it that way yeah and so we ended our last episode looking at deuteronomy 30 and it's kind of comes down to a lot of the same thing today yeah. it's going to be yeah. a, a repeated thing is <laughs> should we read that again yeah, yeah. <laughs> the lord says i put i put before you today life and death and yeah. blessings and curses choose, choose make life. the decision choose life. repeatedly yeah choose life so that you walk might live. this way yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah so love the lord your god and choose life that you might live all right so let's sum it up where have we been today yeah so throughout this we've seen that we've been given desires uh, yet sir We've been given ambitions, and we could use those ambitions, those desires for good, or we could use them as as evil. We could use them against the will of God or, or follow the will of God, and it's something that's in us since we have the knowledge, knowledge, which knowledge comes desire, and we need to exercise the desire that goes after God. You're going to become the propensity of your desire. So whichever one you continually do, again, this is very Hebraic, this is who you are. I hear people say all the time, well, that's not who I am. Well, if your decisions and your actions repeatedly show you making decisions that way, guess what? That's actually who you are. Yeah. Um, we do see that sometimes we're prone to go off, you know, off the, off the trail, you know. Yep. Uh, Jesus says that, that our flesh is weak, and Paul yep. says that, that Jesus crucified basically the, the sin in the flesh that was on the cross because our flesh was too weak to keep the law. And, and so his answer to that is practice righteousness. Yeah, practice righteousness. Yeah. And that that's the whole thing of the spirit in us. And now, yeah. like you said, we had in the Old Testament, they had the spirit influencing from the outside. But now we have the spirit influencing from the inside. And as right. Paul says in Galatians, where he says that we need to sow to the things of the spirit. Listen to that, the voice of the spirit, the 
and the Yetzer Hatov and, and so into those things in our life to create our habits and our character and our behaviors in the way of yep. Christ. Yep. And if you're reading it this way, and again, I'm going to say it's hard not to, you're going to have a hard time saying that we're totally depraved and completely unable to seek after God. Mm -hmm. When all these verses talk mm -hmm. about making decisions towards righteousness because that becomes who you are. And that's the issue that I kind of have with the Calvinist thing. We have all these, like, life and death, blessings, curses, versus, right. like, choose the way of righteousness or choose the way of evil. Choose like, to say whom like, you will serve. Like, As for me and, and if, my household, yeah. yeah. And if we can't actually choose, is God lying to us? Right. You know, like if he says, hey, do this and you can't do that, like tell a giraffe, hey, go climb a tree, yeah. tell a monkey they can climb a tree. Never mind, I already yeah. made that decision, decision for, for you. Right? Yeah, he's yeah. not going to command us to do something that we're not able to do. Yeah. That would make him unjust. And we, yeah. That's good. Yeah. So that's today's episode. What, yeah. what are we doing next? Next week, we're going to continue this, but look at infants and children, um, look at the, the nature of uh, children and kind of, you know, take this conversation maybe a step further looking at total depravity uh, infant depravity i guess you might say in the augustinian view and how scripture doesn't actually teach that and that's going to be interesting because when you go down that trail it opens up to jesus's incarnation and mm -hmm. that's going to be the following episode yeah, after that how it connects so we will get there may the lord bless you and keep you